Next Radio with Broadcast Bionics. Innovative solutions for creative people. Hi there. Um, my name's Chris Price. Um, I describe what I do as music strategy where broadcast and webcast collide, which basically means that I work with both uh, broadcast, traditional broadcast radio and streaming services to, to build audience through content curation and creativity. Um, so why on earth did I listen to Foo Fighters Radio for 24 hours? Um, well, uh, it's a question I was asking myself a lot after about 14. Um, having programmed or editorialized music for both types of radio over the past 15 years or so, um, I've been convinced for quite a long time now that both sides have quite a lot to learn from each other. So uh, when Zane Lowe announced in February that he was going to Apple from Radio 1, uh, I wrote a piece called um, Five More Things That Internet Radio Should Steal From Broadcast. And uh, I kind of felt that, despite having been quite a heavy user and occasional employee of some of these services over the years, uh, that I needed a kind of laboratory conditions service comparison if I was going to go around telling Internet Radio where it was going wrong. Um, it's a very timely debate, actually. Only this morning we've seen um, Spotify calling out Pandora on the uh, ukulele coefficient. Um, it's getting pretty nasty out there. If you want to just jump on Twitter and see how, how nasty things are really getting, just go to hashtag ukulele coefficient. Uh, it's, it's vicious. Um, I chose uh, artist radio in particular because uh, it's becoming a kind of minimum viable product for uh, all types of service, whether it's pure play services like um, Pandora, all you can eat services like Spotify, or even in a, a small handful of cases, uh, linear radio like iHeart. So, what did I learn? Well, the first thing to note um, is that there are loads and loads and loads and loads of ways of listening to artist radio. Um, these are the, the 12 uh, major services, uh, all of which I listen to for two hours. Um, note that only two of them are what you would call broadcasters in the true sense of broadcaster. So iHeartRadio and Apple Music, or Beats One, I should say. Uh, why did I choose Foo Fighters? Well, first of all, I just chose the, the genre that I'm strongest in, kind of alternative rock, just to sort of take some of the heavy lifting out of judging whether a, a general audience would know the songs. Uh, and I chose Foo Fighters in particular for three reasons. Um, one, they are known to a general audience, so uh, in, the, in the end, I think it's going to be mainstream listeners who decide whether smart radio kind of emerges from the margins uh, or just remains quite a niche pastime uh, outside the US, obviously, where it's quite big already. Um, secondly, I'm a huge fan of Foo Fighters, and when you're staring down the wrong end of 24 hours, similar artists listening, you kind of have to be. Um, and thirdly, they're a sort of in-the-middle band for their genre, so there's a good stock of kind of popular but more alternative stuff to the left of them, like um, Queens of the Stone Age and a whole bunch of stuff to the right of them, like Nickelback. Um, and I was just interested to see which way the services uh, would swing. Um, next major learning from an exercise like this is that uh, Foo Fighters Radio makes a really good random name gem generator for um, aspiring US modern rock bands. Um, because when you've been listening to um, about 15 hours of Creed and Red Hot Chili Peppers and Stone Temple Pilots, it all just sort of blends into this in indistinguishable stream of Third Eye Temple Peppers, um, Green Slave audio dolls, um, and Creed Box Chili Pilots. Um, uh, all, all of which strike me as quite good names for a band. Um, so, first proper learning, I guess, from all of this is that the, the programming quality across these services really varied hugely. Um, so I listened to 30 songs on each of the, the 12 major services, giving each event in that stream uh, a one or a zero, depending on whether or not um, the programming of that event, usually a song, uh, would be considered good programming by uh, broadcast radio standards. And the scores ranged from 27 at the top for Pandora down to uh, 11 at the bottom for Audio. Um, so bravo to Pandora, a smart radio service, unafraid to play the hits, that's what we like. Um, obviously, you'd expect um, a, a radio-first service like Pandora. Uh, they've been doing it quite a long time. They've just celebrated their 10th anniversary. You'd expect a service like this to come out quite near the top. Um, and obviously, with their much smaller library of about a million songs compared to about 30 million for all the rest there, um, it puts them much closer to broadcast radio in terms of programming philosophy. Um, notice also that the, the top five services here are all American services. So we've got a bit of catching up to do here in Europe. Um, Next thing I learned is that the artist range also really varies hugely. 
Um, this is a chart showing the number of artists played across those 30 positions. So we're talking about artist repetition here. So uh, we ranged from quite an impressive 27 from Napster down to a paltry and embarrassing nine from Audio. Can you believe nine artists over 30 positions? Um, and there was a very definite divide between those services that sort of majored on the kind of US cock rock staples of the Creedbox Chili Pilots variety, um, and then all of the others uh, like Pandora and Apple and Napster. So well done to them for kind of digging a bit deeper and unearthing some more kind of hidden gems like Jane's Addiction, um, Husker Du, Dinosaur Jr., even at one point on Pandora, and Van Halen, which after about um, 14 hours of Third Eye Temple Peppers was more novelty than I could bear. Um, if you're wondering, by the way, what that um, little red sort of donut-shaped emblem is denoting Creedbox Chili Pilots type services, I, I wondered, I couldn't work out how best to represent them. So I, and I started off with metal hands, and then in the end decided that the best way of representing these types of bands was um, a little goatee beard. Um, next lesson uh, is that... Um, Algorithms um, will just as easily offend as delight. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, to the point about the sort of creed box, the abundance of creed box chili pilots type bands, um, there's a class of Foo Fighters fan, and I count myself among them, who would ra far rather hear artists and songs less obviously connected to Foo Fighters sonically, perhaps, um, like some of the stuff on the left there, like you know, hip hop or dance or Americana than some of the stuff on the right, which is more obviously connected in terms of sound, but more sort of um, offensively bad qualitatively. Um, and, you know, that type of listener on the right is obviously going to be underserved by um, a lot of the stuff that they're hearing. Um, so that's the, the main stuff I learned. Um, just moving on now to a few lessons for internet radio for, for broadcast. And then at the end, I'll come on to a couple of lessons for broadcast radio. So the first lesson for internet radio is that familiarity trumps discovery at scale. Music, dis, uh, music streaming services are absolutely obsessed with discovery, uh, which is as it should be. When you're, you know, as a user, you're faced with all of the music in the world, you need some help navigating through that. Um, but music discovery, by which I mean people actively seeking out new music, or music that's new to them, is actually quite a niche pastime, almost by definition. Um, as, um, as any broadcast radio programmer will tell you, most listeners tune in not to hear new music, but to delight in lovingly crafted sweeps of mostly familiar songs. And the challenge as a radio programmer is to keep your output sounding fresh in light of this rather inconvenient but unavoidable fact. Um, mainstream audiences, which is to say large audiences, which is to say the kind of audiences that most of these services want to go after, for the most part know what they like and they like what they know. Um, even new music networks, like Radio 1 for example, um, whose obligation to expose emerging artists is enshrined in its service license, even they know that without solid golds and recurrents to underpin their daytime music strategy, that there would likely be no audience to expose those emerging artists to. Um, so this chart shows, first of all, the number of artists on each service that would be familiar to a general audience. So that's the orange line running through the middle. Um, and then the blue blocks, the number of artists that are popular on that service. So you can see there's a cluster of services towards the left there, we'll take Spotify as an example, that are playing songs that are not just unfamiliar to a general rock audience, but unpopular on their own service, um, which, is, um, which is about as uh, big a missed opportunity as I can uh, imagine. So streaming services, and this is especially true of all-you-can-eat services, are so obsessed with, this, with discovery that... Um, they sometimes forget to fill their recommendations engines full of the stuff that drives discovery in the first place, which is familiarity. And if they expended as much energy uh, to, on, on that as they do on discovery, they'd have bigger audiences listening for longer. Um, next lesson is that um, recurrence build audience and sell ads. Um, recurrence, as many of you in the room will know, and their, their sexier sounding friends, hot recurrence, and power recurrence um, really are the backbone of all contemporary music radio. They're the stuff, they're the songs that keep mainstream listeners coming back again and again because they have the benefit of being relatively recent but also very popular and very familiar. Um, and as you can see, um, so this is a, a, a kind of a representation of, of, of what a lot of broadcast radio music, music libraries look like. Um, so if you've got the number of 
songs per week along the uh, vertical axis and then the size of the song category along the horizontal axis, you get a kind of pyramid. So the playlist stuff, the brand new stuff, all the cool new stuff that we all get really excited about is very much the tip of the iceberg. And it sits on top of this broader, deeper band of recurrence. These are the songs that bring people back again and again, and crucially, they sell advertising. And recurrence sit on top of this even broader, deeper uh, category of golds. Um, in 24 hours of listening to Foo Fighters Radio, I heard one song that might be considered a recurrent. It was uh, Royal Blood on Napster. So the fact that there was only one suggested, uh, that was probably more by accident than by design. And so internet radio, I, th I feel, is really, uh, has yet to wake up to this sweet spot between the very brand new and the very old, uh, which is what brings people coming back again and again. Um, next lesson for uh, internet radio. Um, presentation is everything. So I'm talking here about clock programming or some version of it and all the other types of content that broadcast radio throws in that adds personality to the listen. Um, with, the, with the exception of Slacker, um, pretty much every single smart radio service available today contents itself with uh, serving up two types of content, music and ads, which is a pretty sort of non-optimal listen straight away. Um, and so, you know, just as a, a great chef doesn't haphazardly throw two or three ingredients on a plate and then send it out to the table. Um, presentation in broadcast radio is absolutely everything. Great recommendations and similar artist accuracy just aren't enough. Um, and I feel that internet radio sometimes gives the impression of just having solved the discovery problem and then buggered off to the pub to celebrate a job well done. Um, clock programming gives your output structure. It gives your listeners reasons to keep coming back. If you reward your listeners uh, for staying with you through challenging content, they'll thank you in spades, by which I mean time spent listening. And what do I mean by challenging content? Well, anything from ads to trails to sponsorship announcements, even presenter links sometimes, and of course, the most challenging type of content of all, new music. Um, last lesson for uh, internet radio is to think globally and program locally. Um, this one should be really straightforward. Um, it almost goes without saying that not all songs or artists that are hits at home are hits overseas. Um, broadcast radio kind of knows this by default because historically it has tended not to cross borders. Um, it's the reason why I can advise clients from Serbia to Santa Monica on music strategy, but I couldn't program a Belgrade pop station if my life depended on it because I just don't have the local knowledge. Um, now, during my Foo Fighters listening marathon, um, I made sure that my location was set to the UK in all cases. So why Spotify, RDO, and Deezer did I hear this uninterrupted stream of US modern rock like Bush, Everclear, Incubus, and all this stuff that's mostly unknown and frequently unloved in the UK? Um, as a bit of an experiment, I, I changed my location to LA and then listened to all three of these services again use, uh, from the US using a VPN. And lo and behold, exactly the same uh, recommendations. So if Foo Fighters Radio sounds exactly the same in LA as it does in London, then it's, it's certainly uh, not personalized and it definitely isn't smart. Um, and then lastly, just um, a couple of lessons um, for broadcast radio for, from, from all of this. Um, I've called this slide atomize, host, personalize, uh, and integrate. Um, I feel like for too long now, um, broadcast radio has been very shy about offering a personalized version of its programmed output on its own platforms. Um, now, this could be down to a number of reasons. Um, there's the obvious technical limit, limitations of um, playout systems and transmitters. Um, perhaps there's a kind of unwillingness to admit that um, you know, if you allow listeners to skip some of those songs that you've lovingly selected for them, that maybe that says some of them weren't so great in the first place. Um, but more than, more than any of that, um, it comes down to cost. There's, a, there's an obvious commercial impediment, impediment to making this happen. Um, UK commercial radio spends about 10% of its revenue uh, on content acquisition. For internet radio, that number's up around 50%. So there's an obvious commercial reason why this hasn't been solved yet, but it needs to be. Um, I was really thrilled to hear that the BBC announcing its um, kind of long-rumored ambitions in streaming last week. That's a, that's a step in the right direction. The fact remains that Apple has beaten old radio into uh, linear programming before any kind of equivalently sized um, broadcast player has achieved anything approaching meaningful uh, personalization on its own platform. So, you know, what's, what's so revolutionary about Beats One? I often hear it asked. Surely all of this stuff has been done by broadcast radio before. That's true to some extent. What's, what's revolutionary about it to me um, 
is, is that it's all happening, it's all integrated and happening inside the Apple ecosystem. It's all Apple apples in the Apple Apple Yard. Um, so when you hear Zane uh, back announcing King Kunta by Kendrick Lamar on Beats One and then inviting the listener to go and check out his uh, deeper catalogue on um, Apple Music, that just feels really, really right to me. And pardon me, Apple haters, it sounds just a tiny bit revolutionary. Um, and then lastly, uh, last lesson for broadcast radio, I just want to um, encourage radio stations to embrace this idea of having multiple personalities on different platforms. Um, I'm talking here um, about mobile, mainly, smartphone apps, um, and in the UK, at least, it feels to me as though um, it, it's often a case of either no app or bad app. Um, an example of no app would be the curious incident of the missing Radio 1 app. I understand there are very good BBC reasons why there is no Radio 1 app, but um, it's, there's a Newsbeat app, by the way, but uh, there's no Radio 1 app, and that's a, there's a missed opportunity. Um, or, for everybody else, all the other stations that do have apps, which of course is most of them these days, um, too often it's, it's just a poor approximation of either the, um, the linear output or the schedule or some combination of the two, so you might have some now playing information, a, shed, a schedule, um, I don't know, a way of contacting the show. Um, there's no true, truly personalized offering there. Um, so why have I ended this uh, presentation with a picture of a smiling uh, Mark Zuckerberg? Um, well, last year he was talking to the New York Times about um, sort of porting from desktop to mobile for, for Facebook. And he said, on desktop where we grew up, the mode that made the most sense was to have different ways of sharing built as features within a website. So when we ported to mobile, that's where we started. This one big blue app that approximated the desktop presence. But I think on mobile, people want different things. In mobile, there's a big premium on creating single-purpose, first-class ex experiences. What we're basically doing is unbundling the big blue app. Um, and that, to me, sounds like precisely the challenge that um, broadcast radio faces. Now, you can almost replace the word desktop in that quote with linear broadcast, or the word sharing with the word listening. Um, I think just as Facebook had to, broadcast radio really needs to rethink what it is and how it behaves across its different platforms. And uh, I think second only perhaps to being able to look back in 10 years' time and know that we were all on the right side of history where ukulele coefficient gate was concerned, um, that is our most urgent challenge. Thank you.